Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Wendell. Thanks for coming out to our talk today. Today, I'm going to present with Jin Pan on benchmark tests and how to of distributed deep learning on horrible runners. So we both work at eHealth. For those of you not familiar, eHealth is an insurance broker who is helping people to find best fit and affordable insurance plan and Medicare plans. And I work as a senior data scientist at eHealth, and I'm working on the engineering and data science sort of a combine. Um, so like data pipeline and end-to-end -end data product. Currently, I'm studying a doctor in the business and administration. Hello, this is Jin Pang. I am co-presenting with Wen Dao today. I work at eHealth as a senior staff, user experience researcher and a data scientist. So in this talk, we'll start to talk about the Horowa and how it works. Then we will jump into the Horowa runner and the Horowa benchmark. Lastly, we'll have Jin to cover in-depth of how, could, how, how to use the Hora runners. So the first question that I want to address here is, uh, why do we need a distributed deep learning system? So um, as increasing data size and the increasing different different model structure, um, the training process it can take days and weeks. One of the way to speed up is to leverage the distributed deep learning system. There are many systems out there, um, but among all, one of the most popular one is Hora. It is open source and a well-maintained library, which make the distributed deep learning um, very easy to use and fast. So user only needs slightly modify the single node deep learning code to make a distributed running on the Horva, and it have demonstrated have great scaling efficiency and currently supporting four popular framework, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, and MXNet. And it also supporting the two main category of how you can run a deep learning system, which is data and model parallelism. parallelism. So in data parallelism approach, we are essentially are training the same model on the different process unit, but you fit different parts of the data to the process unit. But on the other hand, model parallelism is where you're training the same data on the process unit, but you split the model into different parts and fitting into the different process unit. And most of the cases, you can fit your model into one GPU, but not the data. So data is more likely to be the bottleneck. So in this talk, we will just focus on the data parallelism. And I will walk you through visual intuition of how Horowa works for data parallelism. So in terms of a data parallelism approach, essentially your data is being divided close to even chunk size of data and sending into the different processing unit. So, and also different processing unit will receive the replicate the same model. So when they start training, they will have the same model setting and each of the process unit will uh, calculate the gradient independently. But at the end of the, each process, you will need to communicate with other devices to making sure they can average the gradient. So start to next iteration, they were using the same set of the model way. Um, the intuitive approach to average all this or communicate all this gradient is to sending all the gradient to one single machine and then machine to average all the gradients and send back to the other process unit. And that approach is called parameter server approach. Many distributed learning systems actually implement this, such as the TensorFlow. But you will notice that the many node is communicating to the one node of which can have, uh, which will make this uh, particular machine become bottleneck really quickly due to the communi uh, network communi communication cost. And uh, as we're increasing the size of the node, um, the complexity of such system is also gonna increase dramatically. So instead, the Horoa was using what's so-called ring or reduce approach. Um, to explain this more intuitively, I would like to use um, where the Horoa name come from. The Horowa is actually named after a traditional folk dance where the dance participant, they um, dance with a linked hand in kind of this kind of circle shape. Um, um, in this graph, we are having the 16 dance participants. And you can think of one of them, each of them as like processing unit. And we give them the unique number from zero to 15. And once each first unit finishes the calculating gradient, we will start to passing the gradient in this kind of um, circle shape from zero to one, one to two. And once you finish in the one circle back to the um, rank zero machine, that machine essentially have all the gradient on all the chain. Then you will take average out and broadcast 
to the each process unit. So in when start to next process, all the model will start to have the same exact way. So in this way, we can making sure the model is trained in a very consistent way. Um, and this is kind of like a simplified version of how Horowa is actually working. Um, but you, you should have like general idea by now. And when Jinpan walks through all the code details in the second part, you can refer some concept back and hope you uh, hopefully you can help you to understand it better. Um, so how was the scaling efficiency? Uber actually published a uh, um, benchmark on three popular model in section V3, REST 911, and VGG 16 where the X axis is the um, number of a GPU, Y is image per second, which can be used as performance metric. Um, you will see the rect transparent rectangle bar, that is uh, optimal scale efficiency. Uh, just imagine that you have linear boost, you throw more GPU, you will get more uh, performance, like a 32 core uh, GPU will have 32 times faster than the one single GPU. Um, where the blue bar uh, is the actual performance. The darker blue just means using the better network. Um, so this benchmark really demonstrated it can have really great scaling efficiency, even in case of VGG16, which has a relatively dense network and relatively shallow, um, but it still scales pretty well. But one thing I wanna mention here is this benchmark is based on the optimized uh, network and infrastructure. So, um, you will require dedicated engineering resources to set it up, uh, include, including the container, uh, MPI, and NCCI. Fine tuning is not a trivial task, even though many big companies implement Horova in house and achieve a great scale efficiency. But there's one academic paper trying to replicate such system, but no overall scale e uh, effect. So, kind of imply that set up uh, such system is not a trivial task and might stop the small company from doing so. So the data break came out and provide the Horowa Runner. So Horowa Runner is a general API to run distributed deep learning workloads on data breaks using the Horowa framework. It, it was built on top of Horowa and there's no need to set up underlying infrastructure. If you're using the runtime 5.0 above, you can just enjoy the um, Horowa Runner out of the box. And you can choose the cloud provider from AWS and Agile. And since we're running on a data break, so it will run on top of a data break Spark ecosystem. Um, so you will have data prep and data training. Um, the diagram we go over, uh, went over with the Horova is actually assuming you have the, all the data pre-trained, like pre-processed already and put into the different machine. Uh, so it, it's actually a separate process. But if you're using the Horova runner, it will be in one place. And you will also enjoy all the benefit come with the Spark like a random shuffling, fault tolerant, and you were able to use it in the notebook. Um, so lastly, I want to mention that Databrick, the Spark is actually using the barrier execution mode to uh, schedule all the job because the, um, the Spark job usually is running independently and they just run embarrassingly parallel. Um, but the horowas actually require coordination among all the different nodes to uh, synchronize all the gradients. Um, Let's just take a quick look on the Horova runners diagram real quick. So Horova runners di diagram there you will see is running on a Spark. So you will have a Spark driver and number of processing unit that actually runs on the Horova. And you are using the um, barrier execution mode to enable synchronized training to synchronize all the gradient at the end of each batch. And they will start all tasks together and restart all tasks in case of a failure. So all of this sounds really interesting, but how good does it perform actually? There's no benchmark available, so we decide go ahead and do a benchmark. Um, and before, but before I dive into details, I would like to mention that Horova and Horova Runner actually come out with something timeline, Horova timeline, which can keep track on the each process unit's status and performance. Um, but uh, it's like it impact on the performance will be badly, and even documentation says so. So instead here, we were just using the standard output log coming from uh, each of the machine and we organize it to get their actual performance. So the first task, the first go benchmark where we replicating the um, um, this example from Databrick Horowa tutorial, we were just using the very simple CNN 
model with two, only two convolutional layer. Um, we're using the AWS C4 2X large instance, and which is CPU to compare the runtime on the 50 Epoch from the single instance to the um, Corua CPU cluster up to 32 cores. So on the right-hand side, the graph on the top is a single instance performance. It took about 15 seconds, uh, 1500 seconds to finish. But as we're increasing the number of the CPUs in the cluster, runtime reduced dramatically. Um, in the four CPUs in the Horova cluster, it was able to reduce the uh, runtime more than half. But as we're increasing more and more GPU, you will see the scaling efficient kind of died down. But it's just because that the data is relatively small. But this demonstrated the Horova runner can have um, great scaling efficiency um, on the CPU cluster. And we're using this right out of the box. We haven't done any optimization. So um, it's pretty replicatable. And next, uh, we are trying to replicate Uber's benchmark um, and kind of like compare Apple to Apple to see how good a core of our run is actually performed. But it's not actually the Apple to Apple because we're not able to use the same infrastructure. Um, but if you're using the whole run the out box, you will get the same performance. And we didn't do the ResNet 101 due to the there's a version in cap 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 um, capacity issues with the whole runner and uh, um, the TensorFlow 2.0 that that's actually what the ResNet 101 was using. So here we're just presenting the Inception v3 and VGG system benchmark. So the graph is to follow the same format as the Uber's benchmark. The, um, transparent rectangle representing the optimal efficiency. So you will see the inaction history at a core of GPU, you can achieve 80% of a scaling efficiency, which is quite amazing. And But as we're increasing the number of GPU, you reduce the scaling efficiency to 63% and 49%, uh, respectively, at the 30, 16 core and 32 core. But even the 32 core, the 50% of a scaling efficiency, it is essentially 16 times faster than run a single machine. On the other hand, VGG is um, slightly harder to scale, which is same as Uber's um, benchmark, uh, but we were able to scaling from the 50% uh, to the 20%. So overall, it um, demonstrated it can scale pretty well, but it wasn't good as performance as Uber's benchmark. There are other models we also try. We also try to run on the graphical convolutional network which is kind of like a primary motivation to try the horror around it at the first place because graphical convolution network has good perform model performance, but it will suffer from high computational cost. Um, we were able to Im implement it on the horror runner, but currently there's no scaling efficiency because the input of the GCN is actually a adjacent matrix, which cannot be divided. So we're not able to leverage the data parallelism um, benefit. And we think the stochastic GCN might be able to help, but we haven't tried this out yet. Horova uh, usually all from the multi-threading. So if you have a one single instance with multiple GPUs, we would highly recommend that you also try the Horova. And it, it, usually most of the time it will all perform multi-threading as well. So this kind of summarizes uh, the first part of the talk. Now I will pass into Jin Pan to cover in depth of how you can actually use the Horova rounders. Hello. Databricks previously published the how not to scale deep learning in six easy steps. We are going to talk about how to use Horvath runner and avoid pitfalls. When you set up your Databricks cluster, first, make sure to use TensorFlow 1. Second, disable SSL encryption. Last but foremost, run this initiation script on the cluster to fix timeout error for all optimizers except the RMS prop, a tip not previously published anywhere. Uber summarizes five steps to implement Horovod Runner's predecessor, Horovod. After the input statement specific to a deep learning framework and the initialization of Horovod environment, you need to move your entire single node code into your Horovod HVD function, train HVD, then 
pass your horrible size to your instance and then run. Now, congratulations, you've achieved the step four of how to draw a horse. And we are going to add small details. This slide shows the order and the location of the original five steps in Horrible the Runner Code. Initialization, pin, wrap, synchronize, and checkpoint. We will explain three additional pain points, parallelized data, retrieve model, and log time. Next, for ring or reduce to function, we need to ensure that every worker is using one particular GPU instead of using a random GPU. We need to list all the GPUs in our slaves and then assign an invariant rank to each GPU. The essence of Harvard Runner comes from data parallelization. Conceptually, data in the train HVD function equals data in one GPU, and your entire data set should be allocated evenly to each GPU. In an indexed solution, you pick every next row jumping by the Harvard size into one particular GPU. In this example, all the red rows go to GPU zero, all the green rows go to GPU one, and all the purple rows go to GPU k. In each GPU, the number of rows equals to the floor of the total number of rows divided by the horrible the size. A bonus question, what is the number of steps per epoch? Steps per epoch equals the flow of rows in a GPU divided by batch size. So what is the problem? There is absolutely no shuffling. For packet files, petal storm can shuffle by default. Then how about images? We can use image data generators to shuffle at each epoch, and we need to properly set the steps to avoid repetition of training images within an epoch. We can use image data generator to shuffle at each epoch, and we need to properly set the steps to avoid the repetition of training images within an epoch. Given the generator batch size, which is the batch size in one GPU, you get the total steps for training, which is M in the example. Then you divide the total step size for training by the horror size to get the steps per epoch in each GPU, which is four in this example. Without the proper step setting, your code will actually run smoothly. The damage, I would say, isn't detrimental. However, because the shuffle is done only at the end of each epoch, if you have more steps per epoch, you will train on the batch again with the same images. This is not as efficient as training on a randomly new selected batch of images. Next, to avoid too many request error, you actually need to load your model from S3. Next, when wrapping the single machine optimizer in a distributed fashion, the most important thing to do is to linearly scale the learning rate by the horrible the size. Here's the logic behind it. First, 
you want to preserve the same number of epochs in the Horvath runner to achieve a single machine comparable accuracy by increasing your learning rate. Second, you have less steps per epoch thanks to increase the synchronized batch size. Voila, you can actually hit two birds with one stone. Rectified add-in is a new optimizer with learning rate warm-up, fast convergence, and accurate initial direction finding. We are the first to implement it in Harvard Runner. On top of parameters specific to rectified add-in, we need to add three additional callbacks for varying learning rate to work in Harvard Runner. First, Metric average callback will average metrics across all processes at the end of the epoch. It is useful in conjunction with reduced learning rate on plateau, and it needs to be written before the next two callbacks. Learning rate warm up will begin with a much smaller learning rate and then increase it. Reduce on plateau will reduce the learning rate when approaching the plateau. In ring or reduce, GPU zero updates the weights from the average gradient. For all optimizers, you need to broadcast the updated weight from GPU zero to the rest of the GPUs and checkpoint the updated weights from GPU zero. Lastly, horrible the timeline takes way too much time and prevent us from seeing scaling efficiency. How do you get detailed time usage more than just the work clock time? We add our own timestamps to the standard Spark master output with the Python login library. In fact, you can use ML flow to record the detailed log and output from Spark slave nodes. In the end, we can extract how much time we spend on each step from the log. The log shows the progress of each step of each epoch on each GPU. On the left side, it is the timestamp that we added. On the right side, it is the standard output. It contains the information on the Horvath rank, the current step, the total steps per epoch, the current epoch, and the total epochs. To summarize, Horvath Runner is a great choice for distributed deep learning out of box. It achieves significant lift in scaling efficiency compared to single machine implementation, even if it is multi-threaded. Compared to its predecessor Horvath, it takes away the overhead of engineering effort at a tiny cost of scaling efficiency. The code is easy and simple to write, and the data needs to be divided. Improvement can be achieved with better bandwidth and easy to instance store. Do not use timeline and do use network level security. Here are the links to our full code and our paper accepted at the top AI conference workshop, Triple AI this year. Thank you everyone for attending this session. We tried our best to make it helpful. Please do not forget to read and review the session because we want to help you more next time. Thank you, bye.